Hello, William Rule here, Executive Director of the Institute for Learning and Development. If you're watching this video and you want some more information, that can be found at uh, my secure website, imustnotuse.com, uh, where I have online courses and training, clinical training courses for uh, counselors, addiction counselors, uh, for renewal certification. Uh, I'm making this video as an addendum to my uh, online course and my teaching course, and, and I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at our community college. Uh, and the course in the PowerPoint is Self-Disclosure and Addiction Counseling, to tell or not to tell. So, um, as well as the online course, I, I go out and I teach that course uh, to programs through entire multidisciplinary treatment teams. Get a group of counselors, social workers, PhDs together at a, at a program, and I can go in and teach any one of a number of my 20 plus courses, and I can sign off on a certificate of completion for renewal certification. I also have open trainings, but uh, but I'm putting this, uh, I'm adding this as an addendum to my online course, but I want to incorporate uh, this video and this new information that I have as in all my trainings and in the classroom as well. So. This was a, uh, an open training that I had on this course on self-disclosure that counselors were attending and a group of counselors from a, pro, a program came, but it was, it was a quite a good mix, uh, eclectic mix of counselors, KSAC teams, KSAC social workers and stuff. So I, I received, a, uh, I received a, a written memo, a written message uh, back from one of the attendees of the training, and it's, I think it's so significant, the perspective that is presented in this, really an essay, uh, that I wanted to include it. And I'm not gonna uh, bias the, the position of the writer in any way, I'm just gonna read it, and I'm gonna let you make a determination. But it really does confirm a lot of the uh, information that's presented in my training on self-disclosure. So I'm just gonna read it and look down at my notes. So. It's right here, so uh, here we go, all right? I'm writing to you regarding the ethical issues of self-disclosure presented in your course. This is an issue I have been given lots of thought to because I have had two therapeutic relationships in which I was the client deteriorate from self-disclosure on the part of the counselor. This has also made me very weary of the tendency towards self-disclosure in the addiction field. Your clinical teaching didn't change my view, but it allowed me to crystallize them and become clear of my, in my mind regarding self-disclosure and why I find it troubling and inappropriate. I think the big question is counselors need to think about why they are self-disclosing and what they are what they are getting out of it. It truly removes the focus from the client, their problems, triggers, and coping skills as was presented in your course. As a client of a self-disclosing counselor, I have resented the time and money spent hearing their quote stories. It has damaged our relationship beyond repair and that I didn't know how to bring it up so I was more comfortable to look for a new counselor. It definitely deprofessionalizes the counseling relationship, and I felt more like meeting a friend for coffee than for counseling. Within a substance use disorder counseling setting, I can see many dangers to self-disclosure. First, I think there is already a divide in this field between counselors in recovery and those who are not in recovery. Self-disclosure allows the clients to, quote, split the staff and play staff members off against each other. I think some counselors self-disclose as a shortcut to intimacy and trust building with clients. While sharing and storytelling is an important part of the 12-step recovery process, there are other ways for counselors to build trust. As a counselor, 
I would make sure to continue learning the language of the 12-step recovery so that I can relate to my clients. When pressed by a client to self-disclose, for instance, if asked if I am personally in recovery, I would say, why is that important to you? If they would say, well, if you are in recovery, you don't know how I feel, I could respond. It may have walked a similar path, but I haven't walked your path. So let's talk about you. Or, well, today we're here to talk about your drinking and driving. Basically, simple, concise statements that are non-confrontational and redirect the focus back to the client. It was good to read your article, discuss and practice these concepts with peers and at work so that we are not caught off guard as counselors. Our clients will naturally be looking to deflect attention from themselves, and it is important to have clear professional boundaries before entering into the counselor-client therapeutic alliance. Having the opportunity to think this through, to really understand the issues that have made me uncomfortable in the past and formulate solutions to draw on allowed me to feel more confident moving forward in my counseling career. I think it's important not to try to bond with the client in a way, in that way to not be seen as a friend. And in our field, we are fortunate there are 12-step sponsors and 12-step programs who can support our clients in that role while we maintain our professionalism. If our clients are distrustful and weary that is their own learned behavior that we need to work with them to resolve. And it is not our job to bridge that gap with self-disclosure. While it might provide a short, immediate feeling of trust, it is sure to undermine the relationship in the long term as the client loses respect and trust in the ability of the counselor to help them as a professional.